expert in this. Um, I studied psychology, philosophy, and I worked in IT. So I'm, I'm not an expert, but I'm just very interested in it. And I read a few books about it and, and things like that. Um, now, Marta already told a bit, why do I do this? <laughs> um, it was something I found missing. In, in the School of Thinking, we discussed a few, thing, a few times uh, things about quantum mechanics. And I, I, I found it, it's missing this many worlds interpretation. It, it's dismissed as something, well, you can't, be you can't be serious about this. Well, let's try. It's a challenge for me. I know it's a controversial topic, and we'll, we'll first do some experiments, and then I'll explain a bit more, and, and afterwards we can discuss. So what we'll be doing? The, the famous uh, the basic experiment, because why do we need all this quantum, quantum physics? Why is, isn't it enough to just stick with the normal Newtonian physics? Well, we'll try to show why we really need it. The double slit experiment was originally an experiment that's, well, I have a laser here and we'll do it. And, but originally it was with the sun. You can do it with sunlight as well. There's a nice um, YouTube video where somebody with a big box and he, he does it with two slits in it and then you see. And it was to, to see whether light, is it a, a wave or is it a stream of particles, photons. Uh, that was to be decided. And they did the double slit experiment. Normally, if, it's, if light is, is like a wave, then we should expect, uh, it's, it's like a stream of particles, we should expect something like this. So we have a light that's going through two very tiny slits, and if it's, if it's just particles, the, the photons end up just in line with the, with the two slits. And I'll show you. I'll try. So here I have the laser, it's, you see one single dot there, and I prepared some uh, interesting double slits, <laughs> <laughs> I just taped, taped it and here we have, well, there are two, two opens. And It's not like this that we see. Huh? I think it's very nice that we, we can really do this experiment here. You see, we see an interference pattern. So we can see that all the lines here, it's also stretched out a bit, and you see all the lines here. It's lines that you have line, and then less line, more line, less line. So that's, that's not so what you should expect. If it was this, if it, it was would be two lines, like two. Dots yeah, uh -huh. two, two, we would have two lines. Okay. Yeah? And what do we see? Well, if you shine the light through one slit, <laughs> it's, you have a bit of a, of a diffraction. It, it starts to get more open. But now we see something like this. Yeah? You can see it there as well. And... Yeah, I'm asking about the okay. short slit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, like a slit? Uh, there are two slits here. Uh, an opening. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Yeah, we would expect that the light is just divided into... Yes. Two. Yes. Yeah. So, this was done to, to prove that light, in fact, is a wave. If light is a wave, and you, you shine the light through two tiny holes or two, two slits, 
you get something like this. This is from the video where he explained it, and it's just in, in a lake, he makes two waves that are simultaneous next to each other, and we see such a pattern. Um, one, part of the, one part of this wave goes up, and it meets the part of the wave that goes down there. So here, you have, it doesn't change anything. You have nothing. Um, we can make it even easier. I can just use I have here a paper clip that's open. one we saw with this was something like this yeah? but now I just use a paper clip in fact it's always it's also the same the light goes one part goes to the to the right of the paper clip the other part to the left and we see we see two parts with the lights and it hits the wall but in between there should be shadow normally and we see in the middle, we again see the, the interference pattern. The waves interfere with each other, and you see the lines again, like like here. You see, here it should be shadow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. You can follow. An interesting part of the experiment. <laughs> so I want I wanted to show this experiment because when we think about quantum physics and you don't expect that you can easily do it at your home. You think you have to need big equipment and difficult things. And but you can take a look here. This is I'll just explain it again. I have a laser here and. Here I just you have a paper clip. So the laser shines on the paper clip, and one part of the laser goes to the to the right, one part to the left. And what we see is now we don't have well we have two points of light, but in the middle there should be shadow normally. And we do see parts of light and dark and light and dark. Yeah? Like like we have here. So that was that was the original experiment to prove that light is in fact a wave now you think you think a little bit different light is in fact it sometimes behaves as a wave it sometimes behaves as a stream of particles but the same the exact same experiment has been done with with other with other things not here we call it light it's photons uh, particles of light but you can do the same experiment with electrons and with, with atoms and they even did it with quite some large molecules even with molecules that are uh, visible under um, electron microscopes so we see the same the same thing happening the, the interference pattern that in fact if you say we say light is a wave okay that that's fine but also electrons are a wave and even atoms and molecules are a wave because they interfere with each other. Well, not only with the particles, but there are, there are different variations on the experiment. And here it becomes interesting <laughs> and strange. Um, you can do it with a very low source of light or um, an electron beam that has very low energy that in fact it only uh, shoots one particle at a time if you only have one electron at a time you can measure it on the other side you can you can hear the beeps from uh, the electrons hitting the, the, the detectors and, and even when it's only one 
par one particle at a time that goes through the experiment, you still see the interference pattern. So that means that that one particle must have interfered with itself. Um, that's something a bit difficult to understand, of course. Um, we say, now we say that the particle is in superposition. It can be in, in, in different locations at the same time. It, one particle goes to the left and to the right of the paper clip. Yeah? Because otherwise there wouldn't be an interference. And that's difficult to understand. We, we want to get more information about it. So what do we do? We try to detect what happens. And then the, the very strange things happen. So you could make some experiment. With photons, it's, it's more difficult because it's not easy to detect photons without affecting them, without blocking them even. It, it is possible, but not, not that easy. But if we, electrons are easier, or atoms are also possible to detect. And if we have once one kind of a measuring device, and we would check whether the particle goes through the left slit or to the right, through the right slit. We could, we could try to measure that. I can't do that experiment here. But, but it's possible to, to try it. If we do that, the interference pattern then it's removed. It deletes. It, there is no interference anymore. It behaves like, just like particle. That's of course the very strange thing. If you try to investigate it, the effect disappears. Um, I said we can't do that experiment. We need much more equipment for that. Like I can do um, something that, that's similar to it. It's called a quantum eraser. And in fact, what we see is if we have information about which side of the paperclip the light went through, then the effect disappears. So there is one way, it was an, an article in Scientific American where they explained it that you could really do it at home, I'll try. Um, and that's by using uh, different polarization. So I have some polarization filters here, it's, it's something very strange. So light has a polarization, so it's, it's a wave and it, it goes in all directions. But if you, this is a filter where you can, where that only the light in one direction passes. So, or either horizontal or vertical. So um, I can, if, if I have the two filters just like this, it, it just, you don't see anything. But if I move the other one, it, it becomes completely black. So, so that's because one filter leaves the horizontal waves and the other filter leaves the vertical waves. If you put them both behind each other, there's nothing left. <coughs> one, one very strange thing is, if I do it like this, it's not quantum, it's just something that I found with this experiment. It's really weird. So there's, you see it's black, you can't see through it now. And if I put another one in between, it becomes transparent again. If I do it like this, it's, it's blocked of course, but if I do it in 45 degrees, it becomes transparent again. Um, and that's the technique we're going to use here. So, I made a paper clip with one filter to the left, one filter to the right, and it's, they have different polarizations. So the one, one filter will filter horizontally, the other vertically. We'll try. I'm 
not sure it will be very good to see the turbo drive. So now I have, I see two, two blobs of light there. And one is, uh, has horizontal polarization, one is vertical polarization. I can, if I have the other filter here, I can see which one is blocking. Um, is this one, is this one slit? And this is, this is the other one. Yeah? So, okay. And that's the other one. So, and we don't see the interference better. Well, there is some because there's some dirt on it, and that also gives the interference. And but normally, it shouldn't show an interference pattern because um, there is in the in the light there is an information about which if if it went left or right. There is some information here in the in the light itself, and because that's sort of making an observation about it. It's not. There are other ways of explaining this. I know, um, but it's it's it is an illustration about how how it works. So now I can cancel one or the other, and but if, if I put it in forty five degrees then here there's no more information about which side the light went through. And then it reappears, the, the interference pattern. Because here we deleted the information that's in the light, in the photons. We delete it by putting them all like this, uh, like this. And then we see that the interference pattern reappears. So, well, the real experiment, not the sim simple one, is, is done like this. Huh? So they have another experiment that's called quantum eraser. It's quite difficult. <laughs> it's a whole setup with four or five different detectors and, and okay. We used it polarized double slit, and so I took these pictures last night. Uh, this is just you have the two blobs of light, one from the left and one from the right side, and then with the polarization filter you can choose which part you see. And if you put the polarization filter 45 degrees, you can see some interference pattern reappearing in the middle. Okay. what happens here now because it's you you delete information that you have and by deleting the information we again come to the, the original experiment something else okay. so in in quantum mechanics this is we describe an, a particle as as a wave function, they say. This is what Schrödinger wrote about it, how, how he interpreted this. It's too difficult. Um, but there is a wave going through, through space that defines the probabilities where a particle can be. That's how you can understand the wave function. So that's why one particle can be at the left or at the right slit or part of the, the experiment. And it can be in both sides at the same time. And when, it, when we see it, we see only one location. And that's, that's what we had. Well, we can't do it here. 
Um, the problem we had when we tried to detect where does the particle go, we destroyed the whole, the whole result. We don't have the interference study. And that was called the measurement problem. Well, or part of measurement problem. Measurement problem is a bit larger than this only, but if you try to measure where it is, even if you can describe it, it, it chooses only one place, and it's a one, in one place I instead of spread out over a whole wave of probabilities. Now, the classical way of seeing this uh, measurement problem, the oldest and the most popular uh, interpretation is the Copenhagen interpretation. It's uh, the way Niels Bohr talked, uh, taught about this. Niels Bohr is, was one of the very famous physicists. Uh, he lived in Copenhagen. That's why it's called Copenhagen interpretation. And he talked about the wave function collapse. If you try to, s to observe the wave function, it collapses and it, it chooses one place. The object, instead of being spread out over, when you try to observe it, it chooses one place and it's only one place and it's one object, one particle. And that's what destroys the interference pattern. But of course it's, that's how they, they thought about it, the wave function collapse, and it's, they don't like it of course, because it means that by looking at it, I change the behavior of, of, of my setup. And that's, of course, physicists don't like that. But is it by looking or by interfering? Or messing by making an observation. Even if it's an, a device that observes it. So you make an observation, you, you gain information about where was it, then it's only in one place. And that's called the wave function collapse. And it's really by making the observation, because we saw the quantum eraser before. Um, okay. yeah. um, it's a very complicated setup, mm -hmm. and there are several places where you gain information about whether it was the blue or the red light, but with some sort of a setup, they delete the information again. That's how you could see this experiment. And if I, there, I detect whether there's an inf interference or not, and the difficult thing to understand is here, the the information is, is deleted out of the information about which slit the light went through is deleted later in time than when we observe whether there is interference. And if, if it's really deleted, then the interference appears again. So that's where you delete the information if it's closer to the end if you come to the place where the interference pattern is made would it no. be less interesting? No, it's even, there are even experiments where they delete the information behind it oh. and that's, that's a difficult thing to understand because you, you delete the information after the light has hit the the screen where it's measured. Yes. It's um, delayed choice experiments. The delayed choice double slit experiments. Yeah. But just one question. So this is like the principle of the sun glass, right? This two ones. No? Yeah. So it depends like sun how you put them, you yeah. get more light or less light. Well, here I... Your perception. Here I leave the light that's 
uh, vertically and here it's horizontally. Yeah, but if you overlap, and if you if you overlap those, then it's it's black. Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't mean then you're blocking the thing, but it doesn't mean that the particles or the light is not there. Yes. It's it's when when one photon is horizontally, it's blocked by the first filter. If it's vertically, it's it passes the first filter, but it's blocked by the second. So it's it's black, and there's no particle going through. No. <coughs> so in the Copenhagen interpretation, we have yeah, they talked about the wave function collapse. So somehow the particle chooses one place where it is, and it's we saw the Schrödinger's equation. Well. Um, Niels Bohr's theory, it, it completely follows the Schrödinger equation, except at the point of the wave function collapse. That's, everybody was really thinking about how can we interpret this, this collapse? How can we describe it mathematically? How can, what can we do with it? And what, because it looks something random, and it's very difficult. And there were some other interpretations, and one of them is the many worlds interpretation, what we're going to talk about from now on. Um, okay. First, you Everett the third. Um, you Everett was the was somebody who came up first with with this with this theory. Uh, in he did he did was a physics student in. Princeton, and he did um, his PhD about quantum physics. Um, he's from, he was born in 1930 and until 82. And it's, it's a bit strange. It's, it, he's a very, very strange man. Um, he lived until 1982, and there are hardly any pictures of him. There's no video source, net nothing, there are some audio tapes and, and a few pictures. And that's it. You're well, describing him like he belongs to this, you know, mysterious phenomenon that maybe, you know, it's coming from. Mm -hmm. He was, well, he studied <laughs> physics and then he did his PhD, but later on we'll see why. Um, he stopped his physics career, he went to work with the Pentagon uh, about Cold War with Russia and how we could handle the things. Okay, very strange. And his theory that he developed in 1956, 1957, it was almost completely forgotten. And we'll see later. Now, one of the things that I, I'm so interested in this many worlds theory is I was reading a book uh, about about the multiverse, and it's already three chapters about you, Everett the Third, and okay, I was reading about it, and then they talked about his life and how he, how he was a very strange person. He dressed dressed the same every day, um, and he had hardly any contact with, with the rest of his family. His, he had two kids. Uh, he was married with Nancy and he had two kids. And, well, he died in 82, uh, I think, a heart attack, because he was, he didn't, was too healthy and he smoked really a lot. And because he smoked a lot, uh, his wife got lung cancer. And his daughter, um, she had some mental problems. She... She went, she became psychotic and paranoid and she had several suicide attempts and one suicide attempt did work, so she killed herself. And then there's only, here's the family, there was only one person left then, and that was Mark. And then, only when I was reading it, only then it struck me that I was reading about about Mark from the Eels. 
it's one of the very good uh, musicians, of course. I've, I've been listening to Eels for years. So, and at that moment, I, I knew that his father had something to do with physics, but I didn't know. And I was reading three chapters, and then it all fell together. <laughs> I, I really remember the moment that I... <laughs> yeah, and that, that's part of my fascination, of course. Yes. So what was he talking about, you, Everett? Um, so everybody in this Copenhagen tradition was thinking, well, what do we mean with wave function collapse, and how does it work, and why does the wave function collapse when I look at it? And, and you ever came with a very simple theory, well, it doesn't collapse. He just, that, that's, that's his main issue. The wave function never collapses. And that was well, not all he had to say about it. But th this, is, this is really the basis. Here we have one picture um, of, this is you Everett. And this is Niels Bohr. I think they, they met two times, and two times they had a big argument. <laughs> um, because of course, Bohr was the most established uh, physicist of his time. He was on the same level as Einstein before him, um, and very, very respected. And then there was some 25-year-old guy who said, well, you're completely wrong, and the wave function doesn't collapse. So it was, um, it was a big argument, and you ever stopped with his physics career, and he went to work with the Pentagon, and it could, it could have just been the end of, the, of his theory. So what he did, what did he say? He talked about what he called the universal wave function. So the wave function of that, that, own, own, that single particle, we, we should think about the universal wave function that describes all the particles in the universe in a superposition state. He was very careful. If you read his uh, PhD, well, you can't read it. You can read it. It's too difficult. But if you, if you see it, he doesn't use the word split because that's the world doesn't split into universes. It, that's not how exactly how, I, how he sees it. And he knew that those things are make it too controversial. So he doesn't talk about splitting of the world, splitting of universe, parallel universe. He, he hardly any he hardly talks about it. He calls it a correlation between the observer and the system he observes. It's, it's later called entanglement. So it's not so much the system which is affected by the observation. That's the Copenhagen interpretation. When I try to look at it, the system changes. It's, for him, it's the other way around. No? It's the observer who comes correlated with the system. So in fact, it's, according to Everett, it's a real external observation is not possible. You, you're always involved in what you're observing. And every observation is an interaction with the system, but not in, in the way they saw with the, the wave function collapse, that it, it affects the, the system. No, you don't affect the system. You become part of the superposition of the system. That's how Everett explained it. You, you become connected to it, to, to the, the duality that's in your system. You, you somehow, as an observer, connect to that. You correlate to that. You become yourself in some superposition state. Why superposition? Superposition is that, that for instance, that one particle can be at two places. And you don't know which, unless you but observe, and then it's only in one place. But when you observe, you are already not in superposition. You are in a, like, version, right? No? Like 
one of the two versions of well, what could happen. That's the consequence. Mm -hmm. If you are if you correlate to the superposition, then there are two versions of you. Yes. That that's that's one of the consequences and the most difficult of course. <laughs> but by bringing in the subject into the equation, the whole system becomes purely deterministic. And that's, that's one of the things that, in theory, was later reused because it, it solves a lot of problems. It's, it's very, from a mathematical point of view, it's, it's very nice. It's much nicer than the Copenhagen uh, collapsing wave function because that's a mathematical problem. We can't, we can't calculate it. For him, it's just everything is purely deterministic. The, the Schrodinger equation defines how the whole universe um, evolves. This, it's 100% deterministic. And of course, that, that's what they like in physics. <laughs> but it's strange that by bringing in the subject in it, it becomes deterministic. That's, that's some paradox, I think. That's a strange thing. But, so what I said, it's an elegant solution. There's no more measurement problem. It's mathematically clean. It just follows the Schrodinger equation. There's no extras needed. There's no EPR paradox. I'm not sure what you should consider. It's, it's about two entangled um, particles, like two electrons that are uh, one spin up, one spin down. They have opposite spin, but when you before you measure the spin, they're in a superposition state. Both the, both the electrons have some up or down, and you don't know. And it doesn't matter, they're both either up and down. And you, you can take them apart, and if you try to measure the spin of one of them, and for instance, it turns out that it's spin up, Immediately, the other is also no more, no more in superposition, it's spin down. And that was a paradox because it's information that goes from one point to the other immediate. So it's faster than the speed of light, and that's not possible. That was the EPR paradox. It's, it's gone also with his interpretation because there's one world in which it's spin up, one, and there's no information going. One other interesting thing is there's no, um, no more distinction between the small things and the large things. For, for Niels Bohr, the small things, the particles, the light, the electrons, they, they are different worlds. They're the world of the quantum. It, it doesn't have anything to do with our world of the large things. It's, it's different laws of physics. He, he sees it as completely different. But he can't say where the distinction is. What is, what is small enough to be quantum? What is large enough to be in the normal world? There's no, there's no distinction. Well, with, with Everett's interpretation, there is no small and large distinction. Everything follows the Schrodinger equation. There's no problem. Except for one small problem, <coughs> we end up with parallel universes. Some, some people consider it more than a small problem, but anyway. So it's, it's interesting to see that he doesn't start with, with or he doesn't make a whole deal about parallel universe. That's not what the issue is about. It's just about there is no wave function collapse. And the many worlds, the parallel universes, is, is a consequence of this. Mm -hmm. So I, I told that um, he stopped physics in. 1957, after his... Yeah. Does it have to be like whole world? It cannot be just like two versions of this event and that's it? In fact, it's the whole world. The whole universe. Why? I think well, okay. it, it will become clear. So, he stopped his physics career and in the 70s, so more than 10 years later, um, some people started to to reread his PhD and become interesting, interested in it. And um, he was asked to give 
a lecture in 1977 in Austin by his uh, by John Wheeler, who who was the prof with which he, he wrote his PhD, um, and all the other persons that are were interest, becoming interesting, interested in, in many worlds interpretation, they were there at that lecture. It was the last time that he spoke about it, and yeah, in 1982 he, he died. Um, and it was, well, it was the revival of his, of his theory there, that started there. And, well, I explained it, there are a lot of interpretations of how should we see this many worlds, because that's the difficult part. Everybody liked that, that it's deterministic and you can calculate it much cleaner. Everybody liked that, that's, that's, that's fine. But mm -hmm. that many world issue is, is something difficult. Some people are really, they say, no, we have many universes in parallel and they all go their way. And it's true, it is like this. And maybe we can try to find out how it works. But they do believe it. But some other people are, well, we take the interesting part of it and we just forget about the many worlds. That's, that's a more pragmatic approach. And for instance, Stephen Hawking had more that approach. He, he didn't really talk about parallel universes, but he did know that, well, it's, it's a nice theory. And let's not talk too much about the consequences. Um, even Schrödinger, before him, when, when Schrödinger made his equations, he already saw, well, there is something in it that, that, that gives us many parallel universes, and, but he never really talked about it much. Okay, a bit clear? <laughs> An interesting thing about this is well, when I was preparing this, I, I talked to a few people about it. I, I asked some information to some people in physics. And, and the funny thing, I think it's funny, it, it's some, some fashion. It's, you don't expect the fashion aspect in, in such a hard science as physics. But when I, when I talk to people about it, it's always... Um, whether they like it or they don't like it. Or, well, I'm not a fan of, I, oh, yes, I like the many worlds interpretation. And it's, or, or even stronger, I don't believe it or I believe in it. It's, it's strange that such a physics scientific theory is, is related with whether you like it or you don't like it or you believe it. I think that that's something funny. Um, Penrose al also wrote some, some book about, well, I tried to read, but it's not easy. <laughs> um, fashion, Fate and Fantasy in the New Physics of the Universe. It's more or less the same, but why do we have to deal with, with fashion and, and fantasy in, in physics? And, and whether we like it or we believe in it. So I, I think it's something interesting. One other reason that um, the many worlds interpretation became fashionable again in 70s and 80s was because of quantum computing. There was a new new area where the first experiments in quantum, in quantum computing was uh, I think in, in the 1980s. Um, it's only now that it's, it's becoming really interesting. This is some Google quantum computer. And quantum computers are something very strange. They use the superposition of, of a particle and they can do calculations with it in some way without observing, because if you try to observe in the classical theory, the wave function collapses and you lose the superposition that you can't, so you can't work with it. But it's possible um, yeah, really uh, elaborate equipment and but it's possible to work with the superposition of the object and to do calculations with it in such a way that at the end you can do an observation and you can 
uh, solve mathematical problems much quicker than with normal computers. And it's really much, much, much quicker. And one of the explanations that they're always, uh, that are easy to, to understand quantum computers is, well, we just do those calculations in all those parallel universes. We use the parallel universes to, to have a large parallel computer that works in, in several thousands of universes at the same time on the same calculation and at the end we do a measurement and we have, we have a solution. So that's, there are other ways of explaining how quantum computers work, of course, but that's an easy one. Well, easy, but it's, it's understandable. People can understand, well, how is it possible that a quantum computer can do so much more calculations in the same time and, well, they do it in parallel, in all those parallel universes. That's, and that's why, that's one of the reasons that the many worlds interpretation became uh, fashionable again. That's also what Diedrich told me. And how it is decided which part does which calculation? That's, that's difficult. No, that's true. You can't look at it. So you have to do, do the calculations without looking at it in, in complete darkness and, um, and at minus 270 degrees. And because otherwise there might be some observation of what is happening and you lose everything. So that's, that's, that's why it's difficult. <laughs> okay, so this was, <laughs> I think, <laughs> this was more or less understandable and not, not quite controversial, I think. This um, okay. Yeah, okay. Up, okay. up till now. Okay. Up till now. Fine. So, let's <laughs> go on. Multiple universes. So, okay. A bit more controversial. Um, one of the persons that followed, well, I, well, I have a book here, The Many Worlds of You Everett the Third. Uh, there are some pictures in it, and it, it's, it's interesting. It's about his life and what he did. And one of the persons that are really influenced by you Everett and that made a whole career about it is Max Tegmark and this is Max Tegmark um, he wrote he wrote several articles about multiple universes and how he sees it and then his view on uh, Everett's theory and and then he wrote a book uh, our mathematical universe and it's 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 really a nice book. Um, it's readable. It's not that that difficult. It's um, and he explains his view on the multiple universes. On what does it, it mean? He's a cosmologist, so he studied uh, galaxies far away and the microwave background radiation and things like that. And and also there he has this, this link between the very big uh, yeah, the cosmic microwave background radiation and the quantum world. Maybe I'll explain later. So, our mathematical universe. In this book, one of the nice things is in at the beginning of the book, he gives an overview about of all the chapters he see he will be discussing, and he already says whether it's. Mainstream controversial, mainstream controversial, or extremely controversial. <laughs> so, um, he sees four levels, levels of multiverse. I'll explain a bit about it. Especially level one. Level one is an interesting one. Um, the, we have our universe. Our universe is the sphere in space with which where there's light that could have reached us since the beginning of time the beginning of since the big bang so 
about 14 billion years ago. So, and space is expanding, so we can see about uh, a sphere of about 40 billion light years in radius. That's our universe. That's the maximum that we can we can see or observe. Because when you go farther, the light has not been able to reach us. It's not easy to, to understand, but that's not all there is. Most people agree that even beyond the border that we can observe, there's still matter, there's still stars and galaxies. And we don't know, we don't know how big space is. Because our universe is our universe. That's, that's well defined. But how big is space? It's, well, almost everybody agrees that it's larger than our universe. But it comes, becomes difficult if you ask, well, is it a bit larger? Or is it really, really much, much larger? Or is it infinite? It's, it's not clear. And there, there's discussions about it. And the thing about our universe is an interesting uh, parallel to, to, to see it is in, if you're in a field uh, when, there's, when there's fog, you, you, can't, you can only see five meters. So you see five meters around you in every direction, and somebody's there, three meters from you. He has his own circle of five meters that he can see, and it partly overlaps with mine. And that's how we can see our, our universe in space. So it, it, it's overlapping. If, if he's 10 meters away from me, I cannot see him, and he cannot see me. But, but there is something beyond the five meters that I can see. But it's, it's similar to our universe. So there is something more than, than what we can observe, but we don't know how far is this. Is it a bit more, or large, 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 or, or is it infinite? There are some, some ways that say, well, it could be infinite, and filled with, with matter with stars and galaxies. Now, if space and or time are really infinite, because maybe time is also infinite, we don't know. It's possible that there was time before the Big Bang, if, if it's possible to talk about it in that, it, in that words, is there a before? It's, it's difficult, but in some views there is an infinite amount of time. Now, if there is an infinite amount of time or space, then it's natural that our existence, our, our world, should reoccur after so many time or when we go so far. <laughs> if there is matter in that space, in in one way or another, it will become the same constellations of objects. Why not? Simple example, the number line is infinite. Yes, yes. no number ever repeats itself. Why should something that's infinite ever have a repetition? Mathematically, the definition of infinity has no implication whatsoever about repetition. Like the pressure, like the repetition of the yes, if there is time? matter, and in physics it's not, we don't have any real numbers. We have a minimum amount of, of size. You, you can't go infinitely small. Yeah, but, yeah, but even the natural numbers, which are not infinitely small, they are infinite. And they yes, but if there is matter, in an infinite scale, you should find the same constellations again and no, again and again. No, no. But no. even if no. like you have the same configuration of like of matter reoccurring somewhere as a pattern, is it the same? So it's like an identity yeah. question, you know? Like yes, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a difficult question, of course. Is it the same or is it just the same constellation of particles? You say it's the same thing, right? It's just 
Or is it the same constellation so like of particles? So like a similar and planet somewhere, like it yes. like can have like all configurations the same uh, in terms of like chemical and so on, but it's not yeah. somewhere else, right? So and in in his book, no, he takes the same, not numerical, not kind of like mm. I like like the the, the the same form, but not not identical. That's something difficult to talk about. I don't know. <laughs> There's another example. Uh, language, you can form an infinite number of uh, sentences on your language. It doesn't give bright that if you continue generating sentences, that at some moment you will generate the same sentence. It doesn't give bright that. You can always make more combinations. You can add more. Mm -hmm. at, one you would have at one point, you will have the same sentence no. again. Depends how, how, how it works. Can you can you make a sentence infinitely long? In theory, yes. There simply is but no but end of this. We sentence. are not infinitely long. So, so if, if you say that the planet should necessarily be finite and it should be made of the same atoms as we are, yes. then in theory that planet could reoccur yes. with an infinitely small probability. Yes. But there's Correct. something that says that planets cannot That's grow the issue. or can be used different elements that don't exist in our part of the universe. Yeah, but like uh, even if it's like composed like in a, like an, as a same combination of atoms, it's not the same atoms. Right? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. That, that's the I don't know. of the indistinguishables. Is, I, uh, is, it, is it exactly the same? If, if, it's, if it's the same combination of particles, uh -huh. then is it the same or not? That's a difficult test. So I don't know. So when you I think it's the same. Identical apples. Of mm -hmm. Twins. But <laughs> that, you previously you also talk about the observer and the and the and the space where it was happening, right? Mm -hmm. So for this, even if you repeat exactly the same uh, combination of things, but you are in a different environment then the behavior won't be the same, yeah. right? Yeah, they, they, can, they can start, become different. They, they initially, they, they, they're the same, but this one develops in this direction, this one in that and direction. That's possible, of course. Cells, eh? mm -hmm. so you have the of course, cells, yes. On the and cells. then from then on, they're not the same anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. So, so that's the theory of the, his level one universe. And he tries to, to estimate, well, just by chance, what's what's how far should we go to find um, our Earth or our Milky Way or again the same? Well, it's it's very 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 far away, and it's it's uh, ridiculous to talk about it because it, it's unreachable. But if it's infinite, well, according to him, it it exists, and that's the level one multiverse. So I have. Parallel universes somewhere we, we can never reach and where the same thing happens as here. That's that's the idea about it. It's I told you it's it's becoming more controversial than the first but part. Why <laughs> can we never reach? Because it's too far away. But we just talk about the micro possibility. So and we you can only the example you, I mean the maximum maximum speed is the speed of light. Yeah but I'm not yeah. looking at the universe now, I'm looking at the cellular level or even the example that you mentioned where you, because of the mist, you cannot see farther, but it doesn't mean that there is nothing else yes. behind that thing. Mm -hmm. So even if our perception cannot capture that thing, maybe you can communicate. Maybe the there is some possibility. Uh, maybe. Yeah, the, that that's the problem. That's the problem of the visible universe. I mean, your speed of light is limited. Yep. So by the time your uh, light signal would reach it, it would have been billions of years ago yep. and it would be completely Yeah, but different. then so you have like electromagnetic fields that are generated by every single electrical beam. Normally you, you, you cannot, no, but electric you cannot get past, it cannot go past, past the, the, the speed of light in, in, in any way. I mean, if that is a thousand billion light years from us, that means then it's the unreachable. Sun, they will reach a thousand billion years, yeah. where it will be completely different. Then it's unre uh, unreachable. And the, the 
the distance he's talking about is really so big that first he says something about so many so many times our the the diameter of our universe and then he, he talks about it in the same words of uh, so many meters but well there's a difference between a meter and the diameter of our universe but when we talk about distances so much it doesn't really matter it's just 27 zeros after it so that's not that that important the 27 zeros um, I had to read that chapter a few times before I understood that you could just switch the meters and the diameters of the universe um, okay so but this level one multiverse is not it's not only uh, with Tegmark and his fellows you also see the same thinking in in old Egypt and in old um, I think Buddhistic and Hindu uh, writings and even with the Mayas you found uh, and the idea of the eternal return if, if time is infinite it, it, everything starts to reoccur again also Nietzsche talked about it that's what the, 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 the number of possible combinations I mean I know you don't believe that you the same thing will reoccur huh? no. um, but, but Nietzsche, the, the but Nietzsche might think about it no, it's the argument of the natural numbers you add one, you add one, you add yes. one and you never come back to the same number that means each time something changes if I have a box with some um, things in it that are arranged in some way and I start to shake it at one point in time, it might be thousands of years, at one point in time, it will be the exact same configuration. No, I mean, in, 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 in yes. physics, you, you speak about ergodicity, and that means that you have uh, a trajectory to an infinite space that never comes back to the same point. Ergodicity exists, uh, I mean, in, an, in, no. a, in a space that is infinitely large, you can reach an infinite number of spaces and never come back to the same one. No, yes. because look, look up, because uh, there is the because there is a limited amount of possible arrangements. No, because it's conditions. Yes, number because of no, no, because there is a minimum distance. You have the Planck distance, and you cannot be smaller than the Planck distance. If if there is a minimum distance, it's it's not. Um, it's it's uh, the, the an infinite amount of. Quantum, quantum wave functions have continuous values, so they can vary continuously. Mm, no, 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 that's possible. I don't know. If if there is con if it's continuous, then then okay, then you you're not sure that it will reappear. reappear. But if, if there is some discretion, um, then it, it somehow it, it is safe. Well, I understand the, the the argument that if you if you try if you Any keep on changing one way, you will have the same thing. Anyhow, we didn't come back to uh, the same thing. No, mystery, no. We, we are not coming back to the same uh, situation till now. Because, because no. the time to come to the same situation might be too long. Might be too long to, to, to know. So. Well, anyway, it's, it's an idea that, that reoccurs in several places. In, in several times, uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche wrote about it, about the eternal return of the things, and he was very um, sad about it. <laughs> that he chose that point. <laughs> I, have, I have done the same thing millions of times already, and still I'm doing the same stupid thing. Yeah. That was Nietzsche's I'm, I'm idea. Just about like, it. Not, not like, does it happen? Because we, of course, can, we can discuss it forever, but is it possible that the like, configuration of atoms or particles that we have now at this moment, mm -hmm. is it possible, theoretically, that it will occur or has occurred before? That's the whole idea. The question like of possibility, of not, but because it sounds like 
it must occur. We must be repeating because of the of the fact that like you know the, because of of the infinity, right? Like, and there like are to me, the different question is like, is it possible that it will potentially might uh, occur? And this is a little bit different question because like potentially when you randomly generate sentences, of course you might have a diff the same sentence reappear, right? Mm -hmm. But it isn't determined that you will. I think you will if an infinite sentence is not allowed and there's a limited vocabulary. But it is, it is allowed. Why, why would it be? There is a limited vocabulary and a limited and number of combinations that mean that then it will read your both, of the, both the elements are, are finite and the yeah. combination rules are it finite. And finite. But we are, speak, like we are deriving it from true. infinity. That's so not how you feel the, 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 the physical world. Okay, that's possible. Very short about the level two universe, multiverse, because now yeah, because so we have one infinitely large level one multiverse, but even besides that, there are several similar multiverses because our level one multiverse, the the laws of physics are always the same. There's always three spatial dimensions, one time dimension, the, the things, they're, they're always everywhere the same. But in the level two multiverse, it's possible that we have spaces with other fundamental laws. And they will make them mostly dead spaces because they won't allow matter to form or surely not life. But that's not that interesting. Then they have the, his, we have the level three uni multiverse, and that's the quantum multiverse that Everett started. That's what Tegmark calls his level three. But we discussed this already. He also sees a relation to level one, but I read this. He says that the level one multiverse is, is equivalent to the level three. And I read the chapter four times then. Still don't understand. <laughs> Maybe I have to read it once more. Uh, it's, I still don't see it. Oh. Okay, here's a picture of Tag Mark together with um, uh, Mark Everett. And Mark Everett made um, a documentary about his father. A very, very interesting documentary. Uh, it was on BBC and it's, it's available online on YouTube. Um, because he, he had a re really weird link with his father. He, they lived in the same house. They, they never talked to each other. Um, he, he didn't know his father until after he died. And <laughs> in, the, in, in the documentary, he, he says that he <laughs> found his dad lying dead on his bed. And that was the first time that he remembers having any physical contact with his father. <laughs> so <laughs> but you realize that the, the key figure you are introducing in this talk, uh, you simultaneously introduce like completely crazy, you know, <laughs> as a background, right? So, okay. Yes, yeah. yes, correct. <laughs> and then his level four universe, multiverse, that's, okay, that, that was the part where he said highly controversial. Um, According to Tate Mark's idea, we, it's not that we can describe our physical universe in mathematical terms. It's the other way around. The physical world is a mathematical model. That's what he's saying. And there are several models possible. Most of them won't generate anything, but some of them might generate a whole universe of universes. And it's still just a mathematical model. Okay, I, I can understand more or less what he means with it, but it's no. a bit advanced. But is there but such, a, such a model? Hmm? Can you develop such a model? Like a model, a model with no, my, my he's just model. talking about that, it, uh, that, that he uh, interprets it as we might be living in a mathematical model. 
I think it's probably just part of it, and the idea that mathematics is more fundamental than matter. Mm, so it's it's, really it's a bit more than that. It's he he really thinks our physical world is in fact it's not this it's not possible to describe it as a mathematical model, but it, it is a model. That's yeah. what he's saying. Uh, but I think that's also what Plato. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But, but there is there is a similarity. Yeah. Something as complicated as a model. He was thinking in terms of mathematical forms that are the essence of what reality is. And at the end, we create formulas to interpret and to make the logic of the state. But, yeah, I think it's very interesting to think there is a mathematical Okay, <laughs> one problem that I have with all, all this multiverse idea, because I'm interested in it, and I'm, it's, it's fascinating, but do I really believe it? Or do I think it's real? I, I'm still not sure. I think I mostly understand what they mean, but I'm, I'm not sure. The biggest problem is, where am I? What is, why am I feeling in this world and, if, and not in the other? And that's, it's the same what you said. For, if, if it's the same constellation of, of particles, is, is it you as an identity? And it's, it's something I don't know how to think about. That's the only real issue that I have with this. The, when, when Hugh Everett was asked, well, by, his, his, by John Wheeler, because that, that he also had a problem, I don't feel like we're splitting universes all the time. Um, and then Everett says, well, you don't feel like you're orbiting the sun at 30 kilometers per second as well. And Okay, it's true, it's some argument, but it's not really convincing for me. I think from a physics point of view, it's, it's, it's okay to, to talk about the identity of the person. You simply say, well, if it's the same configuration of, of atoms and particles, it's the same. And from a physics point of view, that's easy. But we lack that... that to see it from a psychological or philosophical point of view. I don't, I don't know if, it's, if somebody wrote things about this. Uh, that's, that's what I would be interested in. If, how is it from a psychological point of view to think about this multiverse idea? About, okay. the, the question is the same as we had the, in this MindScan yes, uh, book, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Not like about the, the, like the whole universe, but just like a in fact, it's also randomness because yeah. um, the the whole the whole universe is purely deterministic in his view, but still we see some randomness because we live in one of the possible universes, and and the course we take is there is some randomness in it, and that's why we see randomness. Okay. On the, other way, on the other hand, we do use some, some ideas about this multiverse thinking. One, one interesting thing is we talk about probabilities of a single event. We, we, they say on, in the news that tomorrow the chance that it will rain is 60%. There's a 60% chance of rain tomorrow. There's only one tomorrow. It either rains or it doesn't rain. It can rain a bit in the morning. Uh, yeah, then it rains. Further in then the it's rain. Rain. Yes, but can you then claim as a television for a whole country that it will rain? Because no, well, no, some okay. Place, in some place. Rain. Okay, but you, you might say, well, by radar, see, 50% of, of, of chance of rain here. Here, okay. Okay, that's, that's, we, you can talk about it. Like that. And what do we mean with it? Well, you say, well, if there were a hundred tomorrows, in 50 of them it would rain. That's how we think about it. So we, we're thinking in, in concepts of many worlds in some cases. I think that's interesting. Another thing, um, we, we, in, in the School of Thinking, we, we talked about brain upload as when later when uh, technology advances and it's possible to, to scan 
the whole brain of somebody, if it's possible or not, it's, it's, we can discuss it, but it might be possible in the future. It might be possible to completely download your brain in the computer, download the, the, the configuration of your brain and recreate it. It might be possible. The same issues. Where am I? You can make multiple copies of yourself. Do I feel still this one, the original, or still do I feel the other? It's also the same with the Star Trek transporter stuff. It, it doesn't exist, of course. It was just created as an idea to make it possible to film the movies because otherwise it would be too expensive to always land and take off again and fake that. That's a much easier <laughs> and cheaper solution. But people have been thinking about it. Is it the atoms that are sent to the other location? No, it's, it's only information about how the atoms are combined. So, in fact, in the links later on, there's a nice movie where they talk about it. It's, it's a suicide machine. They, they scan whole, your whole configuration, they kill you, and they recreate you on another place. The same issue. Nobody thinks, well, there are some people who wrote about the ethical aspects of the, trans, uh, the Star Trek transportation. Um, but is it really me on the other side? Or is it somebody else with the same configuration? It's something to think about. And one last thing that's related to this, and I have to talk about it because otherwise Marta will be disappointed. There's some other experiment that we can do, and yeah, it's, it's related to this, to the place of the ego in, and, and how they see it from a physics point of view. Quantum suicide. And Quantum suicide, quantum immortality is linked to quantum suicide. It was Mar Max Tegmark also who wrote some articles about quantum suicide. Um, mainly as a joke or as an illustration of his ideas about multiple universes, I think. Or some thought experiments. So, what is the idea? You, it's, it's in fact some um, a variant on Schrodinger's cut. Uh, example. You can make a machine gun that fires or doesn't fire every second depending on some quantum observation, depending on the spin of an electron or the, if it spins, if the spin is up then it fires, if it spins down then it doesn't fire and you, you could make some, some machine gun like that or a nuclear bomb that, that if, if every second or every three seconds in this movie um, some specific quantum event happens then the bomb explodes and the, the experiment is when you put your head in front of the machine gun if you do that there's always 50% chance every second there's a 50% chance that you live or don't live in the Copenhagen interpretation you'll be dead in a few seconds. In the many worlds interpretation, there is one you that keeps on living. So it might be a test whether the many worlds interpretation on quantum is, is <laughs> correct or not. <laughs> but of course it's not, it's, it's a test, well, you can do it, but but then when you publish the result, it should reach you the other guys, right? Yes. <laughs> if, if I put my head in front of the machine gun, I'm, I'm a, in, in this interpretation, I live forever. Huh? I, I, don't, I don't die. It's always, there's one part of me that's dead, one that's alive, one that's dead, one that's alive. And I only know the one that I'm, I'm alive. Yeah? Of course, the, the observers <laughs> that are also in the classroom, I'll be dead in a few seconds. Yeah. That, so, and you can't talk to, uh, to anyone about it. Because 
You can, you can like hundreds. <laughs> yes, you can have hundreds of thousands of. Of that, it's it's. Yeah, it's it's a very. It's it's a nice thing to to talk of, to think about it. But not to try. You you shouldn't try. You shouldn't try. I had I needed the link. Don't try this at home. I, okay, correct. So, um, I have a few uh, links to movies and other things that I used for all my presentation. So when okay. there is like... Crazy.html is the first link. <laughs> 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 yes. Crazy.html is the first link. If like, human know, if we take the, the system of knowledge as a system that has rules and so on, and this is how it introduces let's call them beliefs, but introduces them in a way that fit into the system so they are like become part of the system, right? So like collective, like the, you, you can say that like the collective body of knowledge is, uh, be beliefs introduce according to, mm -hmm. to some rules, right? That fit other beliefs and like, and yeah. also like beliefs about how we, what we consider as uh, validated. So mm -hmm. let, let's put it like in, in a very, very vague. You mean socially? One portion to. Like, like, it's taking culture. like whole knowledge as a, as a like big social system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where like all those uh, and statements and every person fits in one or more way yeah, so then, to the system. Uh, like, yes. what is. Uh, like, are there any ideas how to make this hypothesis? Uh, Introduce into into physics as a as a part of like that it fits to, to like what would be the way because um, it's a, like a you know like it's a very nice story right and then like a uh, very interesting one and then like how does it like is it possible even like to to put it into physics physics right? that's a difficult question and I think mm -hmm. some of them. Some people will say, yeah, of course, if you have the same configuration of atoms and particles, you have the same consciousness, same so memory, is it, is it the same everything. And some people say, no, uh, consciousness is more than just the configuration of particles. Mm -hmm. but, but then the question is, what, what is it then? What, what is it more than the configuration of particles? I think the configuration of particles is, is all there is. I don't know, yeah? Okay, well, we, we discussed already a few things, but let's go on discussion. Okay. Uh, what I didn't get was the connection between the many world hypothesis and the interference, the double slit experiments. How does it solve the double slits? If you make an observation about where the photon passes in to the left or the right, you yourself becomes connected to the superposition. You see, one you sees it through the left, one you sees it through the right. And you, you exist in both states. But of course, you exist in both states, but they, they go each their own way. And you only see one solution then. And you don't have the interference. Uh, so it means that you split yourself into two different universes. Yes. One, uh, one, one is tangled seen. with a left photon yes. and one tangled with a right photon. Yes. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't explain why the interference is there otherwise. If you yeah, if, you, if you're not entangled with it, that photon um, it will only become one photon when you see it at the end, and it will it will travel in a superposition between left and right. And on some places, if it's more to there, it both will cancel each other out, so it's gone. That's that's the interference. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and and that only happens when they're still in superposition. more like not explanation but it's like situation of the problem 
And then, like, you follow with a completely different like way of hypothesizing about this. Like, what's what is this? Like, it's. Uh, <laughs> So the essence is that it's sort of a collapse of the way back that one of the two is is ch chosen and the others are eliminated. Yeah. All of them <coughs> exist, but all in different yeah. universes. So it's so like a point. Okay, like we don't like, and you you were saying, oh, we don't like it collapse. Like, what could be like other possible explanation than this collapse, right? Because we don't like for some reason don't like it. So like, what what else could we like? There are some other theories mm -hmm. as well. Eh? Mm -hmm. so there is also some theory about hidden variables. We cannot measure at the moment that, but that there is some position inside, deep inside every particle, but we are not able to measure it. Something like that, and but it also makes the Schrödinger equation more difficult to work with, and and there are some some other theories as well. And there's also decoherence, um, but I didn't want to start about decoherence because it's really difficult to explain. <laughs> of interpretation of quantum mechanics, there are about as many interpretations as people who have preferred. Yes. To, uh, <laughs> Correct. So the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics is very reliable. Yes. If you use it to calculate what will happen, it turns out to be very accurate in about all circuits. Yeah. That's the most important thing. And then in terms of interpretation, you might say you don't need an interpretation. It's a, it's a little bit well, of Copenhagen interpretation. It's just yeah. well, you don't really need to know what really happens. You need to just yeah. use shut, up, shut up and calculate. Shut up and calculate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's not very. Uh, it, it's not, not it's very nice. But well, it's, in it's a sense, it is what science always does. You don't understand everything you I think do it's with something your formulas. I think that is something that physicists can live with, but we're from philosophical point of view and we don't like that. <laughs> okay. I think this is like the, the, the point you are discussing here, like the, uh, hypothesis and so on, is like basically like a border which like physics and philosophy and assumptions and belief and you know like excitement all merge together because this is like a border where, where we don't know. So, and, and this is like an extremely interesting like border of knowledge yes. because and because like because what, it, what it does to people, it you affects know, like what you. you see, and it it really like affects people you. People start generating amazing, you know, crazy uh, variants of, of human like knowledge as it is, because they are trying to differently describe what like what might it be, right? And and mm -hmm. this is like um, there is like one hypothesis uh, which is like this, and there is another one. And there's another, and there's another, and then the question is like, and then like what, right? Like how do we, like what do we do with those hypotheses? How do we like because they are uh, nice stories and they are mm -hmm. fascinating, but then yes. you know like what is the like? And and should we really do something with it or just As okay? That's that's the that's story system, about it. But yeah. like like the pragmatic approach. Well, we like the many worlds interpretation for its its cleanliness and and the deterministic aspect, but. Forget about the This is like a methodological question, like how do you advance science? Because like you have a hypothesis and like what is the next step when you have it? Like what is the moment like where it becomes like a And also you have to convince the others. But because by what? You know, just by by like stories I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think the talk here was um, you know that my question was how can I be more convincing? And so uh -huh. it's nice that uh -huh. I have some really <laughs> controversial <laughs> Uh, topic to talk okay. about. And, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. You showed us so much enthusiasm about <laughs> these issues. <laughs> That's also an interesting thing, of course. <laughs> enthusiasm. And um, how uh, do these considerations affect your everyday life? <laughs> <laughs> or is it a mere um, <laughs> experimental? issue uh, they don't affect me in normal day-to-day -day life i don't think i so. don't think so i'm not thinking well i could be another multi I, i'm also in another multiverse so i don't have to uh, I, i'm not thinking like that no but your, no. Be your behavior can be <laughs> your emotions are very varied. You can go from anger to joy to uh, enthusiasm to uh, to deception. Uh, every every emo 
illusion is present at every time in your neural capacity and still your behavior goes in one direction so a choice is being made whether yes. and how and so has it never occurred that this theory could could apply to your behavior to everyone's behavior mm -hmm. and, and and give a yeah it has you are you are the builder of it yeah. you, you give direction to how your behavior evolves your thoughts evolve you are the, the master of your well <laughs> it depends because if the if the universe is really purely deterministic, then you don't choose anything. It, it's everything is, is already chosen for you. How how everything will evolve, but you still have the idea that you choose which universe you're traveling through as as an um, identity. Uh, but you don't really choose think of because like you get entangled in a moment of superposition and you are just multiplied through that position. By Maybe every, there is a by, link. By, by every moment that you observe something, which is all the time, you just multiply, mm -hmm. right? So yes. uh, Well, then maybe there is a link. That's what I said. We should explore the, the philosophical aspect of the identity in such a multiverse. I think, I think it's an interesting point of view. Like, if you ask me, like, which version of the universe I would vote for, I like this one. It's much more interesting, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> Maybe but that's for maybe each, that's the but basis. But for each version, like, of free will. what does it change for each like of this multiple versions? It's 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 the free will discussion. Yeah, is is free will the same as choosing which universe you continue in as an identity? But I don't By see. I don't self. see like how does it come with choice because yeah. it's like mm -hmm. some. No, in this case you don't have a choice. But I I think the the the, the major misunderstanding here is that. People have difficulty dealing with the notion of uncertainty or potentiality. You cannot predict the future except in certain limited ways. Mm -hmm. That means that there are always more than one possibility. And these possibilities, you think about them, they exist in your head, but it does not mean that these possibilities need to exist in some universe. Saying that there is some universe where that possibility will be realized it's not saying anything because there's universes anyway you cannot reach them. So it's just a way of kind of embodying or materializing Maybe something that so. is a probability inside your head. What is important is that you are making models that allow you to predict, and in some cases you can't predict, so you can at most put probabilities or possibilities, but there is no reason to assume that these possibilities, because you can imagine them, also need to be realized in some universe. That, that is just an, a, a, a materialization of something that is conceptual. There is no reason. It, it's, it's the same as with Platonism. Platonism means mm -hmm. I have some idea it's in my head, so that the idea mm -hmm. must actually be in the reality outside of me. It must be. No, I mean, ideas in your head are there to help you deal with the world by giving you what ideas, what's more likely to happen and what's less likely to happen. That's what thinking in your head means, giving you a range of possibilities that are more or less probable and helping you to decide. And do we, do we need a world outside us? Yes, of course we need a world outside us. The world outside us is the one that tells us whether the possibilities we have imagined can be realized or not, because you can imagine all kinds of things in reality will never happen. But a good model is one that gives you a pretty Mm -hmm. good prediction of this is likely to happen, this is not going to mm -hmm. happen. Uh, yes. The better your model and quantum mechanics is at the moment the best model we have for uh, subatomic uh, or atomic level scale things. And people are unhappy because it's not deterministic, because the older theory of Newton was deterministic. But why should it be deterministic? Nothing in this world practically is deterministic. None of the predictions we can make are. Mm -hmm. We cannot predict the weather no. tomorrow, whether it will be raining or not. To some degree. But to not some degree, yeah. yeah but Have you, did you ever find information about this in the world of mental um, disorders? No. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Yeah, it, was, it was wondering, like, why he... Why, why, why well, the 
first link yeah. ends with crazy.html, yes. Uh, <laughs> why you cho chose to like introduce those people like by giving the background of mental illnesses in their uh, in their <laughs> 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 No, that's, like no, that's <laughs> true. But, but, but well, Everett was a very uh, clever student and a clever thinker, I think. Yeah, but you chose like what you think. But I, but I chose to more to put like emphasis yeah. on yeah. this craziness, maybe. <laughs> What's the use of spending your time on issues that? As you told <laughs> us, doesn't affect your life. Because it's interesting. Yeah, because I like it. <laughs> because okay. I find it interesting. <laughs> it's Fair enough. So it it's fascinating. It makes you feel happy. If it makes you happy, yes. you know, it's a yes. fairy tale. <laughs> it's, it's a hobby, actually. Mm. So much less boring than things that are just, you know, established. And that's, that's it. Right? Uh, I think I'm too <laughs> economical about this. <laughs> Well, I see him like the economical part is okay. Here we have like a one person an issue, ladies and gentlemen, this is the wife. What I really love about it is to see him passionate about it, and it's something that's really. But I don't understand the what's passionate. Well, I don't really have this. Could could you was was I, this I a bit clear? What you were saying, yes. Yeah, or also <laughs> like this theory but in the world of of. Spirit and ghosts and all those things. I mean, a certain moment you can extrapolate there also, right? No. no. I, I'm just asking, I'm just wondering. But then you're on the edge of religion, belief. Yes. Yeah, but, yes, but, but anyway, it's it's philosophy, it's then it's why not? It's like the, the, need, the need for explanation is very strong, and you're really into the very scientific ways of. I, for example, I would, I won't, I don't mind at all to be more in a, more a Yeah, that's also why, that's science. also why I talked about the, the fashion idea about it. Huh? Yeah. I'm more into it. Into it, yes. Mm. And then you say it's bullshit, but when you say this, then I say a little bit bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but then we are something else. Um, I just wanted to add that Olivia Newton-John is the granddaughter of Max Born. Oh, oh really? Yeah, yeah. I'm not really? Really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm the one that has <laughs> 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 So there's also the link between physics and music. <laughs> yeah, which is very Okay. So, uh, um, thank you. 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 Thank you.